because uh, the, the term reflexivity came up in in uh, sociology in the 70s. And I, I only became aware of it relatively recently. But there are really, sort of, really quite a, there's, there's quite a separation between <coughs> economic theory and, uh, and sociology and anthropology. And I come from economics, so that's, uh, uh, to me, uh, uh, reflexivity was missing. <coughs> on, on the other side, in, uh, 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 in anthropology, uh, as I, uh, which I know much less, so I, I don't have the grounding, uh, it was er recognized earlier, and I think it, it has it, it, this idea that, that uh, reality is shaped by values and, 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 and perceptions and biases has perhaps been carried too far uh, because sort of the, uh, the, the postmodern idiom is uh, uh, that there is no reality or there are all, there's only narrative. Everything is a narrative and any <coughs> acceptable narrative you know, can be considered. And I think that is an, a, an excess. Uh, Similarly to the, to the excess in economic theory, uh, classical economic theory, which comes from the Enlightenment and, and uh, uh, the belief in uh, a separation between uh, the observer and the, and, and the world. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, the idea that, that we are somehow removed from the world about which we, we, which we observe. Uh, so that was one excess or one misconception. And, and I think there is another misconception, which is that there is no reality, only a narrative. And I think that the, a better understanding of, re, of, of, of the situation is to realize that our biased perception, biased or processed perception of reality is part of reality and shapes reality. But still, reality doesn't, can never correspond, or does not never, but doesn't necessarily correspond to our understanding. And therefore, you have unintended consequences. So I find that this, my view of the world, my epistemology, uh, this uh, idea of reflexivity is, some, is a sort of in between these two excesses. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Uh, you uh, described three conditions of water when you were um, describing the theory of the reflexivity, and um, you also make a comparison between three conditions of water defined by temperatures and three conditions of social systems defined by values. And what are those um, three conditions for social systems? Well, it's a metaphor I use to describe, you know, uh, uh, open society which is somewhere in the middle, similar to the, the this high epistemology being between these two extremes. And you have then similarly in real in real life uh, conditions of extreme rigidity, which are a, a, a totalitarian uh, society, or or any uh, sort of uh, maybe in, in the past history based on religious beliefs. Uh, uh, so it might be an ideology or, or a religion that imposes very strict rules on, on, on society, sort of frozen uh, uh, with little free individual freedom. That's one extreme. And then the other extreme, which is an extremely permissive society, uh, a chaotic society, a society in breakdown, uh, or a revolutionary situation. And uh, in the Soviet Union, 
in the history of the Soviet Union, you had both both extremes. You know, you had the uh, Stalinist uh, totalitarian regime, and then you had the collapse of the Soviet Union and the you know, uh, chaotic conditions that uh, that uh, and open society is somewhere in between. There was and open society can be threatened from from both directions, and that was the the change in my thinking. I mean, originally, uh, I accepted uh, sort of Popper's uh, uh, framework and had this uh, dichotomy between open and closed society. And then, when I got involved in the uh, uh, dissolution of the of the Soviet uh, system, I discovered that, that there was a <coughs> danger from the other side. That, you know opening up a closed society doesn't necessarily lead to an open society. It may just lead to chaos and collapse. And that was a, you know, that, that was a surprise to me and that I, fo I was forced to adjust my thinking and... and yeah. But uh, can you explain more on the values? Because under the frozen situation of the social systems, values were reinforced. <laughs> the values were reinforced. They were not coming from people. Yeah. And uh, in, um, you would think that in a steam, uh, like a chaos situation, val people are driven by their values, so it must be a reality. Mm -hmm. So the chaos state might be a reality of all people driven by different values mm -hmm. altogether. Well, that's what causes the chaos. So the, the, I think the, the point I, I, I was trying to make is that uh, that um, the, this frozen uh, uh, society see, is also a self-reinforcing process, which is what you're saying, that that uh, uh, up to a point, it, uh, is it because it, it, it can actually um, uh, become stronger and more and more frozen. Uh, uh, so it's not it's not this, this, this static disequilibrium. Also has this uh, um, uh, reflexive connection between ideology <coughs> and 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 reality. That if you know the reality can actually reinforce the ideology up to a point. That's what I was saying. Before we go too far away from the topic, I wanted to back up a little bit. Uh, when you talked about the separation of the, you know, the classical assumption, the separation of the observer and the system, and then the process of, the, of observation does not affect the system, and that is something that represents in the dispute. And going back to more basic levels, I've heard uh, one of the concerns regarding the concern is this, that if you're a small trader and uh, you observe the system, how does uh, your perception affect reality possibly in any way? Of course, see, I mean, so there might be a difference between a large uh, so hedge fund manager versus a small investor community. How, how would you like that? In a, in a well functioning market, a anonymous participant does not affect the price. Okay. Uh, so there is an, uh, there's a process out there which is reflexive. There's an interaction between politics and, and, uh, and, uh, and the market, let's say. There's an interaction between the, the central banks that uh, take action and make speeches and the uh, reaction of the currency market. So it's out there. You, you as an in, as an individual investor, <coughs> cannot uh, uh, influence that outcome, but you can uh, understand it better than the other guy, and guess what the course uh, of, of of prices is going to be. And if you guess better, you know, if you guess well, you make a profit. If you guess badly, you lose your. Shirt. So <laughs> that, that's the way 